I want to, I really want to thank you, thank you for such a great, great introduction. It's a great honor to join you amazing people. You have succeeded in graduating from New York University, which has topped the charts as a dream school in the United States, and it's probably the most dream school in the entire world. I, I give, your, give yourself a round of applause as I salute you. My graduation in 1960 from the University of Texas was quite different. I had organized a march on the Texas Capitol to protest the tuition raise, sat in at local lunch counters with the university's 200 token black students out of a student body of 17,000. I had just missed being elected president of the student body by 30 votes. Promising to appoint a young African-American student as a cheerleader, thereby integrating the entire Southwest Conference of the uh, sports, the, of the sports of the country. It was totally segregated in those days still. The deans had discovered I was homosexual through gossip from somebody who had gone to counseling at the local student center something that usually would cause you to be summoned to the dean's office where you would be given the option of taking a test, a lie detector test from the Department of Public Safety, the Texas Rangers, to prove your innocence that you were not a homosexual, or you could drop out in three days with nothing on your record or if you refuse to do either, you would simply be dismissed from the university with homosexual, a very damning word in those days on your record. As one of the university's best known students, I was simply informed by the deans that the University of Texas could not have a homosexual as the representative of the student body. The 30 vote defeat saved me. I realized that, I, that the career I dreamed of in elected politics was not possible. Notwithstanding all that, I bring you stories of progress and hope. When I was your age, which doesn't seem to me that long ago. We were all criminals, except in the state of Illinois. Same-sex attraction was classified as a mental illness. Gender identity wasn't even a concept. You had drag entertainment, and there were other people that referred to in the media as sex change cases. In 1958, I became the 21st member of the New York Mattachine Society. There were only 100 or so homophile activists, we didn't want to have sexual in our names, <laughs> in the entire country. We believed we could change the world and we succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. If you had success suggested to me that I would live to see legal gay marriages in multiple countries around the world, Gay, lesbian, and transgender love stories included among weddings in the New York Times, I would have suspected that you had taken too much LSD. <laughs> In 
I'm, I'm tempted to tell you that now it's your, change, your time to change the world. Actually, after some very serious thought, I must say that's exactly the challenge facing you. In many parts of the world, people like us are under attack. None of us, activists or not, should ever lose their lives because of who they are. Being exposed and labeled gay today in Eastern European, Middle Eastern or African countries means certain death. It's your duty to save our sisters and brothers from such fates wherever they would be. When I was your age, I was terrified, terrified at the idea of growing old. It was said nobody wanted you when you were old and gay. I hear you've heard the same. <laughs> then I met Prescott Townsend, a gay activist from Brooklyn, I mean from Boston, oh dear. <laughs> 45 years my senior. He owned three dilapidated rooming houses on Beacon Hill and built two structures out of debris he collected from the sea on a sand dune at the very end of Provincetown Actually, he gave the address as Province Towns and P. Towns End. Over the next decade, I got to know an old man who was known and loved by everyone, from young hippie girls to middle-aged store owners. Prescott had a trilogy that he believed to be the key to a full and happy life. I want to share that trilogy with you tonight. Love, money, uplifts. I loved, uplift was defined by the manager report as sublimating your sadism into leadership and your masochism into art. I love that trilogy. It ranks love first over money second. Uplift turned two negative forces in the human character, sadism and masochism, into positive forces of leadership and art. In 1965, an interview I did with Prescott, he emphasized to me, do for others and you will find happiness. Prescott Townsend gave me one of the greatest gifts I ever received in life. He greatly reduced my fear of growing old. And let me tell you, it's great to be 86 years old and healthy and happy. My early years in New York City were consumed by activism. By getting homosexuals to speak for themselves in radio in 1962, the FCC officially ruled homosexuality was a legitimate subject for discussion on the airways. Suddenly, every radio station in the city wanted to interview a homosexual. And I was the only one <laughs> available. <laughs> others, others in the Mattachine Society who were probably equally eloquent didn't dare because they couldn't risk having their voice recognized even on radio because it was costing their jobs. I volunteered working for, working for free, producing programs for WBAI FM radio, which was a subscriber supported radio that had broadcast the original program. My interviews with drug addicts, Bowery bums, dolphin researchers, and counterculture authors proved quite popular. Random House publishers 
actually sought me out and gave me a book contract and the equivalent of 55,000, I mean $15,000 <laughs> in today's money to write a book about what people thought about money. I worked with many groups, not just gay ones. Those supporting civil rights, democratic socialists, the, and I found it Neymar, which the group that was launched the idea of legalizing marijuana. I was the, fir I was the first editor of the marijuana newsletter in 1965. But actually, the Sex Freedom League was the most fun because we covered everything from legalized abortion to you know, the right to go naked in, <laughs> at the beaches. Or, and also, they joined me in having the first demonstration for homosexual civil rights outside of the Army Induction Center in 1964. Anti-war protests actually that were what I was most passionate about. It was the most terrible years of my life, watching that war begin and evolve. I was in the first demonstration against it. They called us a bunch of kooks walking up Fifth Avenue because 95% of the, of the nation supported President Johnson at that time. I, sh I took dreadful nine to five jobs, relocating tenants, selling business machines, working in ad agencies, and editing girly pulp magazines to pay my $50 a month rent. <laughs> Rents, were, that was up from the $39.10 I paid for my first apartment. In those days, we had the ability to get inexpensive housing that gave us the freedom to pursue other things. We need that to come back again. <laughs> I, I just want to suggest that as you go out in the world, you're gonna have to make compromises. And whatever compromises you have to make getting jobs, always find ones that enhance your skills, expose you to other areas of life, and especially offer opportunities for self-employment. I started by publishing slogan buttons as a hobby and selling them through ads in the Village Voice and at protests on the streets. Things like equality for homosexuals, that's a good ice pot, dump Johnson, <laughs> you know, in, in 58. Writing proved too much work for too little pay, which you, I will warn you now, is very, very true to this day. However, publishing successful activist buttons was fantastic. They cost less than three cents and sold for 25 cents or more each. In 1966, I took $3,500 in savings, opened a small shop at 28 St. Mark's Place, the very center of what would be Hippie East Village. <laughs> I, in the first year, I grossed $200,000 and netted 40,000. They featured me on the business page of the Washington Journal in an article entitled, Pull Market and Buttons. You always work hardest at that which genuinely interests you. Focus and hard work often renders unexpected results. It's an old story, hobbies turning into businesses. In Lakeland, Florida, an accountant friend of my family's had a hobby of raising tropical fish in two or three small ponds he had in his backyard. 
He dug some pits in a nearby marshland after he had learned how to breed the fish and keep things from killing them and whatever. And in five years became a millionaire shipping tropical fish to pet shops all over the world. Finally, let me share some stories, some embarrassing stories perhaps, to give you perspective on your future romantic and emotional lives. <laughs> your success and happiness does not depend on a successful marriage. Haven't you noticed that heterosexuals usually have two or three in their own lifetimes these days? <laughs> the end of my first long-term eight-year relationship nearly killed me. I ended up with colitis, which is a stomach condition where you produce mucus and actually became anorexic. I went down to 138 pounds. I believed in one love forever. But during any marriage, you either grow together or you grow apart. Life is always changing. I met David Combs, the love of my life, in 1972. We opened an antique shop for just $150 monthly rent in 1974 on Hudson Street, just north of Christopher in the village. He had introduced me to the world of flea markets and antiques. I could tell you that in the end, 29 years later, the rent was up to $6,500 a month, unbearable. Running a psychedelic button and poster shop taught me the mechanics of running a retail store. My corporation in the East Village, which we founded in 1966, was called Underground Uplift Unlimited. It simply became Uplifts Incorporated in 1974. We filled it with furniture and paintings we had collected in our huge rent control apartment in Brooklyn. Uplift had doubled in size by 1986, after re and after rebuilding the interior, David Combs fell sick with HIV. During the next four years, he grew grotesquely disabled. I was able to keep him on the books, support him, and see he got the best medical care. We had a deathbed wedding in 1990, officiated by an Episcopal priest with cake, flowers, and friends surrounding us in celebration three weeks before he died. Uplift survives, supporting a constant, slowly changing group of people, many of whom I came to consider family until 2003 when I turned 65 and retired. Being self-employed, I can't emphasize that in much, how much that is important to become self-employed, enabled me to hire AIDS activists who could not work on the books, but who were perfectly healthy otherwise. Marsha P. Johnson had moved in with me in Hoboken and helped care for David Combs over the years. She didn't work in the store, but it was her sanctuary and dressing room where she slipped in and out of her costumes and arranged the crowns of flowers in her hair for which she became famous. Among the activists I hired was Sylvia Rivera, who I watched spend countless hours 
connecting scattered trans communities from different cities and organizing the first large march specifically for trans rights. Earning the moniker, the mother of the world's transgender movement at the Millennial World Pride March in Italy at the birth of this century. Successfully running even a small business gives you money and power to impact, which will impact the world in ways you never imagined. Just remember, in closing, romantic infatuation is unavoidable, irrational, <laughs> and dangerous. I can't believe how much, how much agreement I'm getting tonight. <laughs> you don't choose those you fall in love with, it just happens. My last bout of romantic fever was painful, ridiculous, and brief. <laughs> it was 1994, I was 56, he was 26, like I said, ridiculous and impossible. As you grow older, friends and companionships are the way to create and maintain your family. My life mate for the last decade has been a good friend for 30 years. We almost never have an argument he loves to clean and cook. <laughs> Let me be the first to tell you that a straight man can make a great housewife. In conclusion, <laughs> I pushed myself to be as negatively tr truthful as possible, possibly too much so. I tried to give you a perspective to minimize any romantic suffering. I tried to inspire you to escape the chains of wage slavery. May the powers of love, money, and uplifts be with you. Thank you all. Bless you. Good night.